Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Dr. Chris Featherstone with another edition of Sports Kids Unscripted. As we do every single week, we have the funnest time. This is actually one of my favorite things to do every single week with my crazy schedule, hectic schedule. It's always good to talk some wrestling with some legends. So this is exactly what we're going to do. Without further ado, you know, I was talking to this person uh, backstage and, uh, you know, I was telling them, I I've interviewed a lot of people. I've interviewed 12 WWE Hall of Famers now, and that's that's a, it's pretty uh pretty wild. And uh, I've had some, my favorites, and I've had legends, soon to be Hall of Famers. I've interviewed a lot, a lot of people, over 200 people who have stepped foot in WWE or WCW or NWA, a lot over the past uh, eight and a half years. And I've never interviewed this person. And I'm really, really excited about it. And uh, I set the bar pretty high for him. <laughs> and so, but I, I know for a fact, uh, if, 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 you know, if I know him, like I knew him back in the nineties, he's going to, he's going to spark some, some ire with the fans. Like he did when he was the Mountie. Cause back then he already, he all, he always got his man. <laughs> he's an all American boy. He is the Mountie Jacques Rougeau. How are you tonight, sir? Oh, you went to, uh he just you just froze on me. He's already he's already playing the heel card. <laughs> he's already playing the heel card. <laughs> oh, Jock, he froze on me just at just right right exactly when he went on me. He played the uh it's it froze on me. So we'll get him on here in a minute. <laughs> let me let me message to make sure that we get everything. I'm sure he's gonna get all that together. Uh I was just looking at him. And he was uh, smiling and ready to go. But uh, that quick, he played the heel card on me already. <laughs> He's already ready. Let's see. Um, um, let's get this together. Oh, there we go. Uh, there we go. <laughs> How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, Chris. How are you doing? Oh, good. I said, you played the heel card on me already, man. <laughs> <laughs> you went mounty on me already, man. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm the one who got the shock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right, man. That's right. Good stuff, man. So like we do every week, uh, we just get questions. Uh, we're already getting questions already. So uh, we're already getting questions. And so uh, it's going to be fun. Um, good stuff, man. Before we get into some questions, man, you got... Uh, you 
uh, are, are fresh in the podcast business yourself, aren't you? Yeah, we, uh, my son and I, we just started our podcast, nice. and uh, we're having all kinds of guests. It's amazing. I, uh, I never thought a dinosaur like me would be doing something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you having a good time already? Yeah, I'm meeting all kinds of people. I'm uh, I'm not only doing it for wrestling. I'm doing it with uh, uh, comedians. I'm doing with uh, movie stars. I'm doing with uh, like next week. I got uh, the pilot who saved uh, 300 and some passengers when the motors quit, and uh, he had to land on an island in the Pacific. He's a friend wow. of mine, and he became a hero. So everybody, I go into different kind of uh, people's story, and it's mm -hmm. amazing how fun it is. I'm, I have Brett the Hitman Hart coming on Monday, and oh, nice. uh, yeah, and I had Abdullah. Uh, which uh, I did my first podcast with Abdullah from a distance, you know, instead mm -hmm. of having it here in my tiki, because I usually have him here live in my tiki. Mm -hmm. And I did Abdullah last week, and it, I, I even paid him, and it didn't work. I had to scrap oh, the whole man. thing. <laughs> so, oh, no. so we're brand new at podcasting. So, but it's a yeah. new world. It's fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm open. I'm open for uh, you know, just just send me just send me a shout, man. Anytime you need help, I've been I've been podcasting for uh, eight and a half years now. So, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow, uh, eight and a half years straight, actually. So I, I've never missed a single week like uh, my show, uh, Pancakes and Power Slams. Uh, this this uh, this show actually branched off from my show because I would do an interview every week, and so. Uh, Sports Kita, uh, uh, we and Sport, me and Sports Kita, we came to an agreement of my interview portion of my show became its own show, it became a spinoff. So this so is you, how you're here now. So, yeah. so you don't only do wrestlers. Uh, I, I do wrestlers every week typically, but I've done I've done other things like I've done a, a doctor that that um, he was a. Um, uh, he, he's a he's a family he's a famous doctor's name Dr. Chris, and he has a, a YouTube channel that. Uh, uh, gives like doctoral advice on like wrestler injuries, and he re and he did oh, it with yeah. the moon, and so yeah. But but it's 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 wrestling though. So yeah, uh, yeah. But it's been all wrestlers though, all wrestlers are wrestling talent for eight years. So yeah, that's fun. I did the uh, last uh, two weeks ago. I did GSP. I don't know if you know him, Josh Saint Pierre, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. the Jordan ultimate Pierre. ultimate fighting guy there. Absolutely. GSP. Absolutely. He was he was something special because what's fun of podcasting is. You go to get all those important people, and then you realize that they're simple like you and I. And it's, yeah. it's, it's just amazing to, to see how normal they are. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, that's you – know, me as a journalist, you know, when I was interviewing – when I started my interviewing process, you know, I, I was like, oh, my gosh. So I've interviewed Goldberg. I've interviewed uh, Booker T. I've interviewed um, – uh, Booker who? Booker T. Uh, ah! Yeah. I know I've, Booker T. Don't yeah, I've worry. interviewed – uh, I like Ricky. Steam oh yeah, he's he's a good pretty people's uh, Ricky Steamboat, uh, Jake Roberts. Yeah, yeah. I've interviewed twelve WWE Hall of Famers. DDP. Hey, uh, I may so, ask yeah. you for some contacts. Yeah, I've I've got a lot, man. But you're the, you're the legend. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've got the Rolodex. So. I got enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're the royalty. You of course you got enemies. <laughs> All right, so let's get uh, started with the. Uh, uh, questions here. We got Elvis asking the Mountie, how did you get your big break in wrestling and who trained you? Wow, what a great question since I'm having Bret Hart on Monday. Uh, I started in the, in Stampede Wrestling in Calgary for Stu Hart uh, and uh, Bret and Bret's dad actually. And I was going to say uh, Bret's dad, but uh, Stu Hart has 12 kids and yeah. uh, so, so <laughs> he's got his own stable. But yes, uh, like the Rougeos were popular in the East, well, the, the, the Hearts were popular in the West of Canada. And uh, so I, heard, I started my first territory for Stu Hart, and what a great adventure. At that time, uh, Brett was driving the bus, you know, mm -hmm. when I was touring then in 77 when I went. Right. So, uh, yeah, it was, awesome. it was great. I really enjoyed it. I was eating. I was actually eating at the house. I was only 17 years old and, and Stu Hart would take me in his house and I'd be eating lunch on Sundays with about 20,000 cats in the house. And then on Monday, it would be the dungeon where, you know, they'd bring the boys to go shoot in the dungeons and that yes. by then I'd be gone. You know, yeah. I, I, 
I never yeah. stayed for the dungeon on Monday. But, so did uh, you uh did you get it? Did you get one of those two hard wrenches that uh, just kind of <laughs> disjoint your arm somehow and uh, just, something <laughs> like that? But I would, he probably got my arm on the way out of the door. But uh, <laughs> but but it's a place I didn't want to hang around. Let's put it that yeah. way. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Ablash is asking. Uh, Hi, sir. Nice to uh, have you here. Was it always a plan uh, for your? Um, for your IC title reign to be a very short one, or did WWE have other plans and change them along the way? No, that was the plan. I got to tell you, that was a great time, though. It was a short time, but it was a great time because mm -hmm. uh, I remember Pat Patterson and, and bringing me into the Vince's dressing room, mm -hmm. and then he sat down and he said, uh, he said, Jacques, I got good news and bad news. He said, which one do you want? I said, well... Give me the good news. And he says, well, you're going to become intercontinental champion. I said, what? I couldn't believe it. I was freaking out in my mind, you know, that I made it to, to there, you know, in yeah. the business. And, and then he, tell, he said, Jacques, Jacques, calm down, calm down, Jacques, because I was very excited. He says, calm down. He says, the bad news is you're going you're gonna to lose it tomorrow, <laughs> like, you know, or two days <laughs> later. And I was like... Oh, uh, right. <laughs> I, I said, but but then it was so funny because the night that I won the title, I called home in Montreal. You're gonna like this, Chris. I called home in Montreal. I have a newspaper contact, so mm -hmm. I called him and I said, "Hey, Adri, I said I'm gonna send you a picture with the Intercontinental Title Belt, and I said I want you to put it in the Montreal paper tomorrow." So he looks. At, so he answers me back. He says, "Jacques." I'm pretty busy. He says, call me in a couple of days. I said, no, 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 no. Yeah, I can't it's good. Call you <laughs> <laughs> we got to put the picture now. <laughs> you know, it, it, that's funny because, you know, I've been a journalist for nearly a decade. And for someone to say that uh, I'm busy, call me in a couple of days. I don't know. Just That just seems weird. That just seems just mind boggling to me as a wrestling journalist. If you would call me and say that, hey, I'm about to wear the air cut on Jimmy, I'm stopping whatever I'm doing. Like, okay, let well, me get on well, this right now. <laughs> well, you know, it's never, uh, how do you say that? The grass is not always as green as home. Greener, that's right. Uh, but but there's some, what, I'm, what I mean is like, you're you're never a king in your own neighborhood, you know? That's and so right. you, have to, you have to work harder to get over in your own territory, mm -hmm. in your own place. So, yeah. so I don't know. Yeah. It was, But it was so funny. And I, what a great time working with Piper, you know, losing the belt to Piper two days later, and yeah. him having the him having the vest there. The uh, I, I shocked him at the end of the match there, but then I turned around, I got the mic, and I am the Mountie. And yeah. by that time, he took his shirt off, and it said "Anti Shock" on this rubber thing that he had underneath his shirt. <laughs> I but love that it. was awesome. But that was it fun. was it was it's it's like the passage, you know, a prophet's out with the, it's without honor to save his own country. So yeah, it's, you gotta <laughs> you gotta put yourself over in your in your own spot, man. It, it gets it, it's even more difficult, uh, but yeah, I, I remember as a kid, man. I I I hated your character, but that, that's exactly <laughs> what you were trying to do, though. That's that's uh, that's the reason why I started watching wrestling in the mid '80s, around '86, and I love faces and heels. That is that is what wrestling is all about to me. It, it is a I always call it a comic book come to life. There's good guys and bad guys. I'm supposed to suspend my disbelief. And you did a fantastic job. It was what ninety one when you won, right? Ninety one, Chris. I got to tell you the funniest thing in that character that I enjoyed the most. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe somebody will ask, but anyway, if they don't, I'll tell you. It's just so mm -hmm. funny. Vince calls me. I've been off for a year now. I took a year off, so Vince calls me back and he says, uh, "Jacques, he says I got a great character for you." And he says, I'm going to send up the fleet up to Canada. So he sent up some, we went into a national park there and in Canada. And then he sent up the horses and he did a vignettes. You know, before a boy, one of the boys would come in the territory for about four or five weeks, they'd show vignettes on TV. Like a mean gene or Jesse, the body would be at the bottom mm -hmm. of the ring and say, Hey, you know, mean gene coming to the WWF soon as the Mountie from Canada. Mm -hmm. And then they'd show a vignette. And in the vignette, I'm sitting on my horse. I'm in I the national that. park now. And then there's this car that pulls up beside me, and it's a couple from the States, from the United States. But yeah. there's a young couple, and the guy's lost in the car. So he puts his window down, comes beside my, my horse, and he says, excuse me, officer, excuse me, officer. And I look down at him, and I go, I'm not an officer in the Mountie. I remember so the that. Looks yeah. up, the guy looks up at me, and he goes, and then he goes, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mountie, I'm lost. Can you tell me how to get to the United States? And that's when I get off my horse and I get in front of the car and I look at the guy that says, come here. 
And the guy doesn't want to get out of the car. He's so afraid of me. He looks at his girlfriend. His girlfriend says, come on, chicken shit, get out. So so the guy, so his boyfriend gets out, and I bring him in the front of my horse. And when I get in the front of my horse, I put his my hand underneath his face like that. And I look at the guy, and I say, you see that part of my horse? It always points to Canada. And then I say, come here. And then I bring him in the back of my horse. And then I lift up the tail of the horse, and I say, you see this part of the horse? It always points to Canada, at the United States, <laughs> to the U.S. And the I guy jumped in the car and he just flew off and took off. <laughs> but they showed that for five weeks. So you can imagine my first three dates that I did when I came back as the Mountie. I was at the Boston Gardens, the Philadelphia Spectrum, and New York Islanders at the uh, in New York Islander, uh, Long Island, Nassau Coliseum. And yeah. I can tell you, people didn't like my joke. I'll tell you, <laughs> when, when, I, when I was coming back, you know, like with the arenas to go in the afternoon, people were mm -hmm. throwing me rocks, you know, and stuff like that. Yes, that's a heel. I love it. Yes, I love it too. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the, the uh, <laughs> this right here is one of your promos, uh, one of your promo picks. <laughs> right if there, ever man. you lost, ladies and gentlemen, you know how to get home. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. This is great. Man. Uh, let's see. Kelvin is asking, who came up with the Mountie gimmick? It was Vince. Nice. It was all Vince. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it was all Vince. I was the one who brought the electric shock stick. Okay. And that, that was, was a idea. really good addition to it. <clears throat> hey, listen, good. I got to tell you a story with that. You know Coco Beware, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You remember Coco Beware? He's mm -hmm. my first opponent. So I'm so nervous as the Mountie, and I got my electric cattle prod, and I'm going, and I have an off, an on and off switch, mm -hmm. and, and in the back, I got an emergency off and on switch because there's mm -hmm. a lot of voltage coming out of that. It's a lawnmower coil, a lawnmower that's reversed the coil, and it makes a big, big flame about this big, and it mm -hmm. really stings the hell out of you if I do it. And for one reason or not, I was so nervous, and we had a 20-minute match, and Coco Beware was all soaking wet. And when I took my zapper for the first time in front of all the boys backstage, I start zapping Coco. And he's going, blah, 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 blah. and I'm going like, shit, he's doing a good job. You know, he's really selling it good. You know, my cat brought, I was happy, but I didn't realize it was on. And by the time I went backstage, I didn't even know that I zapped him for real. So yeah. I'm like just waiting with my arms all open, like, oh, Coco, I love you. What a great job. And he came backstage. <laughs> you... And he wanted to kick my <laughs> rear end. And I go, whoa, what's wrong? <laughs> and he looked and he showed me he was burned on the chest. Oh, man. man. That was my first appearance. So imagine all the other boys that are sitting in the dressing room. They see me with my shock stick and they're going like, no, I'm not working with him. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that is hilarious. So, so how did you get, how did you end up rigging that thing then? It, it, well, like I said, we took a lawnmower coil and mm -hmm. we reversed the powers on it. And then my my buddy did that. I don't know. I'm not really that kind of electrician mm -hmm. or nothing. But mm -hmm. but it was a uh, it was a real stuff. It was the real stuff. And uh, and it got over because the, the Vince was always adding. You could see my flame at the end of my stick, but Vince was always adding a bzzz, like on mm -hmm. TV. The bzzz, and it was it, it was good. It was fun. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they would so they would dub that into. The production uh during the tv then hey chris i gotta tell you something that's so funny when i'm zapping coco beware mm -hmm. and he's shaking all over the place and then i'm going to myself because i knew they have good technology now you know with the smell and this and that and then it mm -hmm. starts smelling like pig you know when you burn the skin mm -hmm. you know it starts smelling and i'm going to myself and i'm saying wow they got some good gimmicks in the WWF now. It even smells <laughs> like it. And it was Coco Beware. Who like, this is actually my skin. Like, so, <laughs> this is not technology. They're not dubbing anything. When this you talk real. to Coco Beware about that, he, he'll <laughs> laugh today about it. But I'll yeah. tell you. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, uh, Nishant is asking, hi, Jacques. Tell us about that infamous backstage incident with the British Bulldogs. Yeah, Cheers. Oh, oh here we go. I don't want to get into it uh, uh, too yeah. much. I just want to say that uh, 30 years later, I found out that I didn't even know the real story. But uh, 
Actually, it was Kurt Enning, the, the shit disturber. <laughs> and then I thought it was d d dynamite because you know the old story about uh, uh, the little boy who cries wolf all the time and there's no wolf. And then finally he cries wolf when there's a real one and no one goes to pay attention because <laughs> they don't believe him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was the, the, the same thing for dynamite because he was ribbing everybody in the dressing room. So every time there was a rib in the dressing room, you'd figure right away, oh, it's the Bulldogs. And uh, and anyway, so they uh, we didn't... Uh, I think we started getting heat with each other uh, at the Madison Square Garden, uh, where where Vince asked uh, Raymond and I, uh, as the fabulous Rougeau brothers, to uh, have a, a match, a 20-minute Broadway with the British Bulldogs in Madison Square Garden, and they were champions. And I think that upset them because they thought they were gonna we we're gonna do a job for them, and uh, because we were just fresh, new in the business coming in, mm -hmm. I think that put a little heat there. And the other thing that put a little heat there, I got to admit, it's. Uh, I don't know if you know my brother Raymond. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, but but Raymond's a quiet guy. Mm -hmm. I'm a loud mouth, <laughs> but I mean I don't mean harm. Mm -hmm. I just I like to have fun. But I, I'm childish. I'm baby. I'm not mature. And it's like I'm in a man's world where, and, and so I, sometimes people find me obnoxious, you know. And and, and it was like that. I, I tried to get better with the years, but but uh, but I, I was a good. I, I just like to have fun all the time, and 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 uh, so so maybe I got on the bulldog's nerve or a couple of the guys' nerves, and uh, and, and it all stirred up to where they uh, uh, they decided to pick on me, and because they were picking on a lot of guys, and uh, they they ruined a couple of guys' career. Uh, thinking about back Jack that was, when I was there, what they did to him, and a couple of guys, it was horrible, mm -hmm. and uh, honky tonk man, what happened to him, and so I'm thinking, I'm not going to become a. Uh, a McFly, like back in the future, you know, back to the future, McFly, mm -hmm. everybody laughed at him, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to become the McFly of the WWF. So, so the first time that I thought it was him that ribbed me because perfect. When I came back from the dressing room, he pointed at my bag and he looked at me and then he looked at my bag. He looked at me, he looked at my bag and he looked at me. So it was like, he was telling me, Hey, they ribbed you, but it was him that ribbed me. No, I heard 30 years later, but anyway, long story short is then I told the Fuji that was sitting there. I said, Hey, I'm not going to take this. Uh, it's hard enough on the road. I don't need this. I know I'm, I've been in the business for 30 some years, you know, whatever. And I don't need this. And, and I'm going to talk to Vince when it comes to Monday. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, not that I'm a stooge, but uh, I was afraid of the Bulldogs. I was intimidated by them. They, they were, they were guys that they knew how to handle themselves. They had a reputation. They were on drugs a lot and, they, and a lot of drugs, a lot of steroids. So they were very temperamental. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm not a fighter of nature. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy who likes to go have fun in the ring. When I joined wrestling, it's because it was a work. You know, if it would have been a shoot, I wouldn't have been in there. Mm -hmm. And so so long story short, there's a, I, I was going to go, instead of going beating the Bulldog up, I was going to go tell Vince, hey, I don't want to stand for this. And mm -hmm. Fuji went to tell the Bulldogs. So when we got to the next town, well, I was playing cards, and it was funny because I was sitting in the dressing room playing cards, and Perfect was against the wall, completely in the end of the, the, the dressing room. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I walked in the dressing room, uh, he called me. He says, hey, Jacques, Jacques, come play cards. Come play cards. And we had a lot of hours to kill in the dressing room, and we always hoped that we could find a partner that would play cards because it would kill time. So mm -hmm. as soon as he offered me that, he knew I was going to take it. <clears throat> so I uh, <clears throat> I went in, and I sat down. Let me just say you got some water. Are oh, you good? You good? So I walked in the dressing room, and uh, and he says, "Come on, Jacques! Come on, Jacques! Come and play." So I went to sit down, and when I went to sit down, I had my my heart, my my cards in my hand like this. I was very relaxed, mm -hmm. and then a bunch of guys came in: the Heart Foundation, uh, uh, Don Morocco, Orton, and then there was a uh, there were six of them, and then there was, of course, uh, the Bulldogs, and. Uh, Dynamite just came behind me and he, uh, bang, he slapped me open handed on my ear. But when you're playing cards, you don't expect that. It hurt. It, it just it didn't hurt. I didn't know where I was. And mm -hmm. then by the time I turned around and say, what the hell? And I turned, and then he was punching me in the face and like, it's all blurry from there. I remember being on the floor and then kicking me on the floor. And then my brother Raymond who was in crutches because he had torn his ligaments. He just finally got up and said, hey, it's enough. And then he punched my brother Raymond in the face. And then mm -hmm. my brother Raymond, he didn't know my brother Raymond, he's a tough guy. I swear mm -hmm. to God. He, uh, anyway, you'll find out about that in time if you ask around. My brother is very well respected in the business. He's a mm -hmm. fighter. So he was in crutches. So when he got the punch in the face, he just looked at him right in the eyes and he looked at the dynamite and he said, you're going to you're gonna hit a guy that's on crutches 
And then Dynamite just looked at him and he said, uh, nope. He says, gonna, I'm going to wait till you get better and then I'm going to up. Like, you know, I'm gonna, I'll beat you up then. But it wasn't the word he used. Yeah. And, 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 and then, so it stayed like that. And, and then I fell into a uh, trauma. I could say a mental trauma. Mm. For about a week, I kept walking every day, you know, going. I was swollen. I was real in bad shape mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. But I kept walking and going on. And I went to Chicago the next day when all the boys thought I'd go home. And I just stayed there. I hung them. And, and every step I was doing in the dressing room, I was always saying to myself, keep going. It's going to get better. It's going to get mm -hmm. better. Just keep going. It's going to get better. And, and I'm sure you've been through some times like that in life. We all go oh, through hard times yeah, where we don't think there'll be a tomorrow. And but 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 wrestling was my passion. It was my only thing that I wanted to do in life. So I, I and plus there was a reputation of my dad, my uncle, my great uncle. We're four generations of wrestlers in in in, in Canada. So I'm thinking of all. My father's a tough guy. My great uncle's a tough guy. My brother's a tough guy. <laughs> and look at me here. I'm all beat up and and ruining the, the the image of the family. You know. And so then I decided. You know, after two three days of being ribbed, the same nights after it happened. And, in the dressing room, the bulldogs kept ribbing me, insulting me, and uh, so finally one day at TV, I just uh, I called my dad in Florida because that's where I got beat up was in front of my dad. My dad, I only saw him like twice a year during like in Miami because he was a snowbird from Montreal. So when we'd land, he'd pick us up. We'd we'd always see our family then, and uh, mm -hmm. and there was a time where my dad was in the stands when he beat me up, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I was Jesus. It was horrible. But anyway, I'm just thinking of my dad, who who when he saw me go to the ring that night in Miami convention, and and he saw Raymond in crutches because he's mm -hmm. looking at the and I looked like uh, the elephant man, but in the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 what my father had to endure. So anyway, long story short, thinking of all that, the pain that I was, I thought I was causing to the family, the image of the family. Mm -hmm. After three nights of the Bulldogs ribbing me in front of everybody, insulting me and calling me jock itch, like, you know, and powder that you put mm -hmm. on your legs. And so all that stuff. And then finally two wires just clicked in my mind. And I said, hey, listen, chicken shit, you got to do something because you're going to be, the, 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 you're going to humiliate the whole family. And mm -hmm. so, so so from then on, and, I, and for three days after the incident, I was with my brother in the car and in the hotels, and I never spoke. For three days, Chris, I never said a word. Mm -hmm. Neither to the boys, to nobody. I was like, you know, I was in my own world. Mm -hmm. And then after the fourth day after they really laughed at me that night in, in Rockford, Rockford, Illinois, I uh, I told Raymond on the way back, it was the first time I spoke after four days, I said, uh, I'm going to do a comeback on Monday. Well, I didn't say it like that. I said more like, I'm going to do a comeback on Monday. <laughs> it sounded more like that because I couldn't use my mouth. It mm -hmm. was really messed up. And my brother Raymond, you should have said his eyes lit up like, Oh yes, yes! Like he was so happy and proud of the family and everything. So, so yeah. then I, 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 that was four days later, and then the next Sunday, which is a week later after the incident, I called my dad for the first time because I forgot that my dad saw all this. Mm -hmm. And when it happened, my dad after the incident at the arena, I got in the car and he talked to me for about a minute and a half with my brother Raymond sitting in the front. I was sitting in the back of the car and I wasn't talking. I wasn't there mm -hmm. anymore. So they stopped talking to me after a while. But I never mm -hmm. spoke to my dad after that for a week. And then mm -hmm. after a week, I started, because I had kids too. So then I started coming back a little bit to earth. And then I called him on Sunday night. And then I told him, I said, Dad, tomorrow it's TV tapings. Everybody's going to be there. Vince, Macho Man, Hulk, everybody. I'm going to make a stand. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I have to do. Mm -hmm. And you know what my father told me? Chris, my father was a wild one, I'll tell you. But my father told me, he said, when you go, before you go to the show tomorrow, stop at the bank first. And he said, go get yourself a roll of quarters. And he says, when you hit him, he says, hit him to kill him. And I'm looking at my dad like, holy shit, that's pretty heavy for me, dad. <laughs> like, you know, to go kill somebody. <laughs> you know, I was thinking that. I never said nothing. I just listened to his advice. And that's the mm -hmm. only thing he told me. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And then I, we kind of hung up because I was so afraid. And, you know, all week. Uh, from the third day on, when I knew I was going to do a comeback, it was been like for four days before the incident, mm -hmm. I lost about 15 pounds. Every time I put some food in my mouth, bleh, I'd throw it up. I mm -hmm. couldn't sleep. I, I was getting bad shape mentally because I was afraid of the fight coming up. I, mm -hmm. I'm not a born fighter, you know, So I, but I knew I had to do it. So, so the anticipation was horrible. Mm -hmm. And then finally when it happened, uh, it was amazing because that morning at 10 o'clock, 
Vince called a, a meeting and he got everybody in the middle of the ring. Uh, he was in the ring and everybody around that. And he said, you guys, what an embarrassment. I'm so embarrassed and I'm, I, 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 and this is the shits and these fighting between you guys and all this. I'm losing my talent. I'm building talent. I'm creating talent and, and I'm not going to stand for this anymore. And the next time, the next time someone fights in my company, they're out and they'll never come back. And at the same time, he's saying that at 10 o'clock. Well, at 10 o'clock, the bank was opening. <laughs> so I couldn't oh. be there. For, so, so we couldn't be there for the meeting. So mm. at 10 o'clock, we're at the bank. I'm getting my roll of quarters like my dad mm. told me to do. Mm -hmm. And then we arrive at the building around 1030. The meeting's over. But when we come in, usually it's TV taping days. Everybody's busy going mm. from one one curtain to another, from Japan to this to that for, for the promos that we do around mm. the world. Mm -hmm. And everybody was sitting in the dressing room. Because Vince had told everybody that day, he says, I'm, we're not going to start promos this morning. He says, we're going to start promos at 1 o'clock. And he said, I want, all, I want all you guys to go in the dressing room and like kids and think of what I just told you right now. Mm -hmm. And so when we got there at 1030, we thought, I thought everything would be going on. And everybody's sitting there doing nothing. So the, uh, this, is, this is really uh, uh, things that, that, that I remember the most is when we got into the arena, there's three curtains, one, three black curtains, there are three dressing rooms, no doors, it's just curtains. Mm -hmm. And my brother's coming with his, 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 his uh, crutches and he's going click, 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 click. And then he opens the first curtain. And when he opens the first curtain, the two bulldogs are there and Dino Bravo, our, our friend, is sitting between the two. Mm -hmm. And they're right there and they're talking, but Dino wasn't on the same tour as us. So, so he couldn't, he didn't know what, what happened. So he's getting a scoop from the Bulldogs. And since we weren't there at 10 o'clock in the morning for TV tapings, all mm -hmm. the boys thought the Rougeos quit. They went home. They quit. Mm -hmm. We were at the bank. We didn't quit. So yeah. anyway, so when we got there, Raymond opened the curtain. And then when he saw Dino and the Bulldogs sitting there, he kept going. And, and, and when I opened the curtains, I wondered why Raymond and crutches. Why is he going further? There's a dressing room mm -hmm. there. So I opened the door right behind him and I saw that they were there. And right then I told Raymond, I said, let's go in. And it was like I was trying to face my demons because mm -hmm. I was so afraid of that day. I was so I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why things happened that day, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And I went in and I passed right in front of him. And when I passed in front of him, I said I, I saw Dino there. I hadn't seen him in a while. And I, and I looked at Dino. I said, how are you doing, Dino? And, and, and he never answered me. He never said nothing to me. And I was like, brother, French Canadian, never said nothing. So I guess we know that he was on which side he had chosen to be. I don't mm -hmm. blame him today when I look back because they were the clique. Maybe if you mm -hmm. were against the Bulldogs, you were in deep, deep trouble. Mm -hmm. so, so I went to sit down. And by that time, when I went to sit down, everybody got up and they all said, we're going to have lunch. So before the interviews, everybody got into the dinner. And, the, and, and when they went, all the boys got up to go to the cafeteria to have lunch before the, mm -hmm. the, the promos at one. I looked at Raymond, and in my mind, I was saying to myself, I was thinking of the Bulldogs, and I was saying, go eat, and mm -hmm. go eat, and eat like a pig, and eat like a pig. That's what I was saying to myself, so stupid, because my father had always told me when I was young, if you have to fight one day, fight on an empty stomach, because... Yeah. If you fight on a full stomach, it could get be a problem, you know. Yeah, and then yeah. so I was saying to myself, "Go eat, guys. Eat and eat and eat." I was trying to put all the chances on my side. Mm -hmm. And they all went to the cafeteria. And by that time, uh, I, I went with Raymond. Uh, I'm going to shorten the story there, but I end up in front of the door of the cafeteria. And for the first time in a week, uh, I saw Orton and Morocco come out alone. They weren't all the six together. And then mm -hmm. I saw the hearts come out, Brett and Jim the Anvil. And then I was saying, my God, it's almost impossible because I prayed a lot. Mm -hmm. I prayed a lot that week, mm -hmm. and more than usual. I don't know if you're like me. When things go good, I don't pray as much. But when things go uh, bad, I do I every pray. day. <laughs> so, so, so I did a lot of praying that week. And by that time, when I saw that the only two left in the cafeteria of the gang was the Bulldogs, mm -hmm. then I said to myself, God is with me because now we're two against two. You know, mm -hmm. so now if anything happens, you know, Raymond will defend me. There's not six of them. There's only two of them. And mm -hmm. Raymond was worth two, only him by himself. So I was saying, I'm in, I'm in good shape. So, so, so by that time, you wouldn't believe it, Chris, what happened. Pat Patterson comes walking out of the, the, the cafeteria. And I haven't seen him in a week, but he's a French Canadian. He's a really mm -hmm. good friend of mine. I wrestled with him for years and years. Mm -hmm. So he comes out of the curtain. 
and I got the roll of quarters. I'm against the wall now. I got the roll of quarters ready to get into action. And my mm -hmm. brother Raymond's on the other side of the hall, so there's only a place for between us to pass. And so Pat comes, and when Pat arrives, he says, uh, he says, hey, guys, are you okay? I didn't even look at Pat. I was so messed up. And I knew it was fixing to hit the shit, was fixing to hit the fan at that moment. And Pat didn't know that. He's just at the wrong place at the wrong time. So he comes out like, hey, guys, how you do? How you doing, Raymond? You know, he was concerned. And, and by that time, here comes Dynamite. But, but Dynamite comes out alone. He's not with Davy Boy. He's not with, so I knew my prayers had come true. And when Dynamite came out in front of me, like he passed in front of us, I, 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 you know, when I, I have a wrestling school, Chris, I had mm -hmm. not anymore for two years, but I had. And the first thing I showed to my boys is a 180 degree look. Like if you look in front of you, I'll do a test with you at home, anybody. If you look in front of you and you really look at the same spot, you could see on your right, you could see on your left without moving your eyes, you see everything. It's called a para, para, paraphilic view in French. Mm -hmm. So, so I had that same view. That's the thing I taught to my students. Because if a guy goes up the top rope and he jumps to make a splash on you, you don't want to look at him first and then stay there. <laughs> if no. you look up there and the guy's coming, so you got to make sure you're not looking, but you're mm -hmm. looking. And that's mm -hmm. what I was doing when, when he came out. And when I wasn't sure, I just looked up to make sure it was him. He had a coffee in his hand. And as soon as he made on, eye contact with me, he put his chest out and he looked at me and he had a coffee in his hand with a big smile. And, and I put my head down like, oh, no, please. Don't hurt me no more. <laughs> Don't hurt mm -hmm. me no more. I didn't say that, but my face mm -hmm. expression was saying that. Mm -hmm. And when he got within three feet from me, I lifted my head up at him, and I looked at him right in the eyes for the first time in a week. And I looked at him, and I said, how you doing? And he went like, and I went, pow, and I hit him as hard as I could. Mm -hmm. Four teeth came out on the first shot, like the two in the front here and the two in the bottom there. Mm -hmm. If you look at my fist here, if I put my fist together, you see there's a wow. knuckle there that there's a knuckle that's messed up, and that's the other one here. Wow. I'm, and, 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 and I swear to God, I thought I'd killed him. But because mm -hmm. of the steroids and because mm -hmm. of everything he was on, mm -hmm. my father, he didn't call that one. And, and he fell on his knees. And after I hit him like this, <clears throat> I'm so happy. Not happy. I, I couldn't believe I did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it's like, and then he's going like the blood is splurring on me like wow. a water fountain and I'm getting the blood all over me and I'm just looking and he's holding my tights in the front like he's not out he's holding my tights and he's fixing to get up and whip me and so it's like he's pulling on to and I don't understand I thought he's gonna be dead anyway so 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 anyway long story short is my brother's beside me and finally my brother says jam jam like you know hit him stop looking at him <laughs> hit him <laughs> like you know and so i hit him a couple of jabs then bad news brown came in got me by the throat pushed me back and everybody a commotion pat was screaming help help that's when i knew that, <laughs> that he uh he had a soft voice pat <laughs> but anyway he was screaming real loud and uh and i turned around and i start walking and, and my brother raymond tapped me on my butt gave me a slap on my butt and and I accomplished something that that was definitely not in my plans in my business, and mm. but it changed it changed the world for me as far as my life. And I've been going to schools for twenty years now, give, talking about bullying and making that. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, met, wow. I met I met over two hundred and fifty thousand kids in, in twenty years face to face and talk about bullying. And I got a I even oh. got a book here. My uh, I'll just show you a book real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a book against bullying, and, and, and I had that done, and I go in schools, and I enjoy it so much because I, I hate people that, 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 that – I hate the feeling of, uh, of being bullied. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, that is our time. Uh, do, do you – do you, okay, do you have, that was fast. Are, are you available in a couple of weeks? I, I would love to have a part two. Yeah, I'll be available yeah. for for a couple of weeks in a couple of weeks. No, okay. I mean I, I got plenty of stories. So yeah, okay, I like, yeah, yeah. There's I'm a so lot. Sorry of... I took, I'm so sorry I took so much time on that. No, no, no. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, that's that's all right. Uh, there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> Lots of questions. So and did anybody uh, ask if I beat Hulk Hogan? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did. I did. <laughs> you did beat Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yeah. I'll send uh, you a video of it. You can show it one day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please do. Please do. Yeah, that'd be yeah great. okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice one. I, uh, it's a nice victory. No, no, no chairs, no nothing. Just a clean, clean pin. Victory. One, two, three. Uh, yeah, awesome. that was great. He was so nice to me, Hulk. Yeah, he was. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get to... Uh, 
let's let's get into books, man. Uh, it's a couple couple weeks, couple Tuesdays from now. Let's do a part two because there's a lot. Call of me, questions. call me when you want to. I'll try to keep my questions and my answers short. Oh, that's well. A part two, uh, we'll, we'll make it. We'll make it shorter. But I've never heard the the. Uh, I knew about the story, but I never heard those details. So it's better. It's best to hear from you, <laughs> you know, because it's from because that's what the story is about. So, but there's something sharing. very very important I want everybody to know. I'm not proud of that. I'm not happy of that because. And one thing I want you guys to know too: when I first joined the WWF, my heroes were the Bulldogs. Mm -hmm. So so just things happened like that. But they were great athletes. And you know, I I almost feel sad for what happened to them in the life in, in in their life. Yeah. But 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 the, but they were. I had fun with Davy Boy as a Mountie after that. You know, he came yep. back and we we that. worked for the Intercontinental Title. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. so I had some great times with Davy Boy after that. And, yeah, and I'm glad that at the end of the day, it it, it really got from um it, it really um taught you a really good lesson. You know, what I mean, it, it really and it, it really it, it really resulted in helping others. You know, what I mean, so so a lot of people, you know, people th thought that this was a great time. TikTok and Musical.ly said this is awesome. So uh, so people enjoyed your time here. And uh, yeah, good. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate yeah. that. I enjoy you, Chris. I, I do. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate but, it very much. But don't forget to tell everybody about my podcast. That they, yeah. That, that, no, I, you I tell had, them now. You you tell them. Plug yeah, away. I had uh, I had GSP a couple of weeks ago. I told you that. Hey, GSP. Yeah. If you have a yeah. chance to go see that one, but we're uh, it's it's Rougeau podcast. Uh, okay. But there's a little bit of French in there, so I hope you could find it. It's on YouTube. It's okay. Rougeau podcast Père et Fils, which means father and son. It's okay. Rougeau podcast, father and son. I do that with my son, and uh, and you could go on YouTube and other platforms. I'm just starting. I'm I'm like a virgin in that, so you know uh, I'm I make a bunch of mistakes, but the the content is great. So mm -hmm. uh, the production is not so good because I'm starting, but the the content that I have in my shows is awesome. So that's why just, people are uh, angry. they're staying with just, me. Awesome! I just sent the link uh, on, in the chat. So, oh, uh, thank you so yeah. much. That's yes, very man. kind of you. Hey, I give you a high five, but because of the yeah. COVID, I can't. We'll do we'll do one of these. High five this way. Yeah, I like it. Way. Other, side, other side. Other side. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. I hope we can make it again. All right, sounds good, Jock. Thanks, thanks a lot for coming on, man. Thank you. All right, bye. -bye. <laughs>